to let out the sails of your heart. Isn't that an interesting statement? You know, I've been praying and asking the Lord this lately. You know, I, w- I want you to think about this. And please bear with me. This is what I got to work with. But I shared with this last night at Fire Night. And those of you who are there, praise God. Thank you for coming and supporting, whether it was the barbecue fundraiser this weekend or at Fire Night. Uh, the body of Christ was doing what the body of Christ is supposed to be doing and all parts were working together. So praise God for that. But this is something that I've been praying about and, and talking to God about. But you think about the, the words of the song, and I guess this has nothing to do with my sermon and everything to do with my sermon. Let out the sails of your heart. And lately I've been asking God to fill me. Now I think a lot of times for Christians when when you hear the word being filled or to be filled, we often think of a cup, to, to fill up a cup. But, but what I've learned is, is that when you ask God to fill you like you're a cup, when the cup is full, it gets heavier, right? If I was to put more water in this, it would get heavier. So what I've been asking the Lord is to not fill me like a cup that becomes heavier to move but instead like this song that sings but to fill me like a sail on a ship meaning that when you let down the sails and like I said bear with me this is what I got to work with when you let down the sails of a ship and wind blows on it it's filled but when it's filled it becomes easier to move. Maybe we need to stop asking to be filled like a cup and start asking to be filled like a sail because we all, I, I, that's one of the most common things I've heard here at this church recently is, is I just want to know what God wants me to do. Well, let's be filled like sails so that you can begin to move into what God has for you. Amen? Amen. Amen. So in whatever capacity, whether you are looking to be filled like a cup this morning or filled like a sail this morning, let's jump in to the Word of God. Exodus chapter 4, verses 1 to 4. But Moses protested again. So this is not the first time that Moses has grumbled against the Lord. What if they won't believe me or listen to me? Think about what's, let me give you some context here. If you don't know what's happening here in this moment, Moses is making his defense to God because God has chosen him to be the man that leads God's people out of Egypt. And Moses is saying, you've got the wrong guy. I'm I'm not him. I'm not the one that can do this. And make no mistake about it, when God speaks something over your life and calls you to something, <laughs> no one can stop that except you. If he spoke it, it must be true. But in this moment, Moses is less than receptive to the call that God has placed on his life. And he's trying to talk God out of the words that he's spoken over him of saying, you're going to go and lead my people out of this prison that they're in. And Moses is saying, I I, I can't do it. He says, what if they say the Lord never appeared to you? Then the Lord asked him, what is that in your hand? A shepherd's staff, Moses replied. Throw it down on the ground, the Lord told him. So Moses threw it down on the ground. The staff then turned into a snake. Moses jumped back, and then the Lord told him, reach out and grab its tail. Now let's just get this clear. If you're afraid of snakes, you're not grabbing this thing. But God said to him, reach out and grab its tail, and Moses chooses to be obedient, so he reached out and grabbed its tail, and it turned back into a shepherd's staff in his hand. My focus this morning as we move through this is not Moses, but what in it, is what is in his hand. 
Not Moses, but what is in his hand. Let's fast forward a couple chapters here. Still in the book of Exodus. Still the same people. Still the same character. But there's another object lesson that's showing up in our midst. Exodus 17, verses 4 to 7. Then Moses cried out to the Lord. What should I do with these people? (laughs) They're ready to stone me. Moses has led The Israelites across the Red Sea and they're in the desert. And in the midst of being in the desert, they start grumbling against Moses and against God. And the Lord said to Moses, walk out in front of the people. Take the staff, the one you used when you struck the waters of the Nile, and called on the rock at uh, Mount Sinai and strike the rock. And the water will come gushing out. Then the people will, drink, will be able to drink the water. So Moses struck the rock as he was told, and water gushed out as the elders looked on. Moses named the place Massa, which means test, and Mirabah, which means arguing. Because the people of Israel argued with Moses and tested the Lord by saying, Is the Lord really here with us or not? Again, the focus this morning is, Not Moses, but the objects that are in these lessons that we see this morning in these scriptures. If I had to give a message, give this message a title, this would be my title. Be a stick, be a rock, be a donkey. Be a stick, be a rock, be a donkey. Before we dive into these scriptures and unpack what I want to teach you about being a stick, being a rock, and being a donkey, I want to issue a challenge first. Now, we know that Bible stories are more than just stories. If you believe in this book, you also understand that this is the living Word of God that is constantly speaking new things, constantly revealing revelation in our lives that we can apply to our lives. It is a live, sharper than any two-edged sword, cutting things in our lives. And as a communicator, it is my job, metaphorically, we would represent the Bible being national news. It is my job to bring national news to you so that it can become local news. And when you receive the local news, it should become personal news. And sometimes... When I am led by the Spirit of God, God takes national, the national news that He's given me and makes it local news and sometimes even personal news. This is why you can say at the end of a sermon, how did Pastor Kevin know all those things about my life? I felt like he was talking directly to me today. That's the Holy Spirit. But here's the challenge. If you're not familiar with the national news... It will be hard for you to receive local or personal news. So what I'm asking you this morning and the challenge that I'm issuing to you is to get familiar with your Bible. Get familiar with the stories that are in this book. And when you become familiar with what's going on in this book, then ask the Holy Spirit to lead you. Ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you what it is that He's trying to speak into your life, into your situation, into your circumstance. Why do I issue this challenge? Because Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3 verse 2, I desired to give you more than milk, but you weren't ready for meat. I had more to tell you about, more to offer you, but you weren't ready. This comes in a five-year gap between 1 Corinthians 2, where Paul is speaking things and encouraging the church of Corinth, and then five years later, uh, 1 Corinthians 3, he begins to speak and saying to the church, come on now, it's time to go deeper. It's time that you're familiar with the gospel. It's time that you're led by the Spirit. These things shouldn't be foreign to you. You can't just drink milk. It's time to eat meat. But I'm not so shallow as a communicator to know that in a sermon, it is my responsibility to offer both meat and milk. 
Think, think about what Jesus said to Nicodemus. He said, I would love to tell you about heavenly things, but you don't understand the earthly things that I'm telling you about. And so my challenge is to get familiar with your Bible and be led by the Holy Spirit so that you can have both meat and milk. That you can have both earthly things and heavenly things. That when these things are spoken of, I will understand them. So let's go this morning. Earth and milk to start. Sticks and rocks are mentioned throughout the Bible. Oftentimes, in different ways and I'm hoping to show you all their different symbolic meaning and different things that they represent but let's stick with the context of the first scripture that we've mentioned already in Exodus chapter 4 verses 1 to 4 Moses is clearly reluctant and fearful in other words he's got anxiety let me ask you this question this morning do you ever build up in your mind the things in the events of your future with anxiety do you ever plan out or plot out what could go wrong before you ever get to what could even go wrong are you tracking with me Moses is foreseeing oh this is not going to go well what if they say I didn't I didn't really see you. I didn't really hear you. What is the answer? You know, when I talk to people about them sharing their testimony, you know what their number one fear is? What if somebody asks me, asks me a question I don't know the answer to? And my personal answer to them is, that's okay. Just tell them what he's done for you. But a lot of times in our minds, we'll build up the possibility of the things that might happen in the future that will create anxiety in us. And we'll play out some scenarios that, guess what, most of the time never even happen. It never even happens. So with that in mind, what, what does God do in the midst of Moses' anxiety? Right? He can clearly see that he's fearful, he's reluctant. What does God do? See, God provides Moses with a simple, comfortable thing that he finds both confidence courage and boldness in a stick he gives Moses a stick what did he say he said what is that in your hand well it's a stick throw it down on the ground this will be evidence so but but here's the thing if Moses got a stick you got something better look at this God has provided us with his Holy Spirit so that we can trust his leading into the events of our future. A staff does simple things. It helps you walk, it can guide and steer sheep, and it drives away predators. At the end of the day, it's still just a stick. But here's what's awesome about these simple things. God desires to do extraordinary things with the ordinary things. Do you hear me this morning? God can take something that doesn't seem significant and make it significant. Such is the case with the stick. You know, it's interesting if we're talking about milk and earthly things... There are lots of stories about staffs and sticks and shepherd's rods throughout the Bible. But modern day scholars believe, and, and I encourage you to do this, if you ever go visit some type of biblical museum, look for a staff, look for a stick. And when you see that stick, it is likely that you're not going to see some perfectly formed and fashioned stick. Why? Well, because scholars believe that every time that a shepherd or a person that was carrying a staff in biblical times would encounter God, they would mark their staff. They would put some kind of scarring on it. They would put something that marked it in such a way that it symbolically rep represented their encountering God. Why did they do that? Because they didn't want there to be a moment go by that they couldn't look at that staff and see the goodness and the faithfulness of God. It served as a reminder that God is who he says he is and he's faithful to bring us through all 
things. Now, think about that. As you think about that, I was reading this week, and I'd love to credit whoever this author was, but I couldn't find it. This is what I read. As Moses and the liberated Israelites make their exodus from Egypt, they are stopped by the Red Sea. As Pharaoh and his army storm closer and closer, Moses can do nothing but rely on the power of the Almighty. He holds his staff up over the water. And what does he see? Of course he sees the sea in front of him, the impassable obstacle. But what if he also sees all the markings he's made on his staff that form a tapestry of God's goodness and power in his life so far? With his faith reignited, he leads the Israelites into one of the most miraculous moments in all of the Old Testament. All this from just a stick. Now, if that's a stick, what about a rock? In Exodus chapter 17, I read to you about a story where the Israelites were grumbling against Moses. It's rightful to think that because they were in a desert, they would be thirsty. But again and again, if you follow the Old Testament in the story of the Israelites, their complaints always come against God and against Moses. And they're never faithful to bring their complaint to God. But Moses is different. Moses seems to always, look at this, Moses seems to always bring his complaint and the complaints to others, of others, to God. Now, Think about these two passages that I've shared with you. The stick is just being the stick. And the rock is just being the rock. Meaning that the stick and the rock aren't talking here. But they are simply ready to be used. Is that you this morning? They're simply ready to be used. Are the sails of your life out and ready this morning? Sometimes it's just better to be quiet and wait for God to use you. Sometimes things aren't going to make sense. But do you hold steadfast in the love of God and allow all things to be worked out for your good and his glory? Sometimes it's just better to be quiet and wait for God to use us. But all throughout the Bible, you're going to see great representation of rocks and stones that have symbolic meaning. Check out this list. In Joshua chapter 4... They are the representation, they were symbolic of the 12 tribes of Israel. In Matthew 16, they symbolize, they're a symbol of Peter the disciple. In Ezekiel 28, a symbol of the splendor of the Garden of Eden. In Isaiah 28, they're symbol, they symbolize, they're symbolized as Jesus Christ. Then you jump clear in the New Testament of uh, 1 Peter 2, they are the rejection of Jesus Christ. Ezekiel 36 brings about that the rocks and stones were the representation of stu- uh, stubborn hearts. Miss Sarah prays all the time here, God take out the heart of stone and replace it with a heart of flesh. In Genesis 31, they symbolize a covenant. In Genesis 49, a, s- a symbol of Jacob. In Deuteronomy 21, a symbol of justice. And in 1 Samuel 17, they are, a symbol of, they are a symbol of God's power. A symbol of God's power. This, this brings this point to our attention. If the word of God is more than just stories, then the sticks and rocks in them are more than sticks and rocks. But let me also say this. We still have a donkey to talk about. <laughs> Which leads us to the next thing. Heaven and meat. Heaven and meat. In Numbers 22. Verse 22. And I would encourage you to go back and read this on your own time. To get full effect of what's being said here. But let me give you a little context. In Numbers 22. There's a man named Balaam. And Balaam saddles up his donkey and decides to go with some Moabite officials. And as he goes with these Moabite officials and riding the donkey, God's not happy with him. 
And so the angel of the Lord appears on the path as he's traveling, sword in hand. But Balaam can't see it, but the donkey can. And in their travel, the first time that the donkey sees it, it decides to dart off the path. And when the donkey darts off the path, Balaam decides to beat the donkey. He beats the donkey. The donkey comes back to the path. The angel of the Lord shows up a little further down the road. This time the path is a little bit more narrow. The donkey decides that it didn't work for me to run into the field because it got me beat. So he decides this time to try to pass the angel of the Lord. But when he does, he runs Balaam's leg into the side of the wall. And Balaam's not happy again. So he beats the donkey again. Still, the Lord is persistent in, in, in his efforts of trying to reveal to Balaam, I'm trying to get your attention. The angel of the Lord shows up a third time, a little further down the road. But this time, the path is so narrow on either side that the donkey cannot go around. The donkey can no longer run off the path. So the donkey has one option left. The donkey decides to lay down. And in its laying down, the man beats the donkey. But something supernatural happens in the moment where this man is beating the donkey for the third time. God speaks and breathes on the donkey and gives it the ability to speak. That's where we pick up in the story. Then the Lord gave the donkey the ability to speak. What have I done that you, to deserve you beating me three times? It asked Balaam. You've made me look like a fool, Balaam shouted. Now, now, how enraged do you have to be not to be able to even recognize that a donkey just got the ability to speak? How stubborn in trying to get your answer through do you? I mean, do you, do you see what I'm saying? How is, it, how is it that I can't even stop and say, did, did, you, just, did you just talk? I mean, like this is some Shrek type stuff here. I promise you it's a talking donkey. But Balaam is so enraged that he says, you've made me look like a fool. He shouted this. If I had a sword with me, I'd kill you. But am I the same donkey you've ridden all your life? The donkey answered. Have I done anything like this before? No, Balaam admitted. Then the Lord opened Balaam's eyes. And the angel of the Lord was standing in the roadway with sword and drawn in hand. Balaam bowed his head and fell face down on the ground before him. Why did you beat your donkey those three times? The angel of the Lord demanded. Look, I have come to block you in your way because you're, you're stubborn and you resisted me. Three times the donkey saw me and shied away. Otherwise, I would have certainly have killed you and spared the donkey. Then Balaam confessed to the angel of the Lord, I've sinned. I didn't realize it was you standing in the road blocking my way. I'll return home if you're against my going. But the angel of the Lord told Balaam, go with these men, but say only what I tell you to say. So Balaam went. With Balak's officials. This is what I want to say to you from what we just read. Don't be a blank even when the world treats you like a blank. And you can fill in the blanks. If you don't remember anything this morning, at least you'll go home and tell the rest of your family, this pastor said some crazy stuff this morning. You can fill in the blanks. Even when the world doesn't treat you good, doesn't mean you should respond the way the world treated you. If you squeeze a lemon, what comes out? Lemon juice. But if you squeeze a Christian, what comes out? What if the enemy is not worried about the church because every time he go, we go out from this place and get squeezed by the world, everything but Jesus comes out. If there's an empty praise in our mouth and we go out and reveal and act just like the world acts, then we're of no threat to the enemy. 
Just because the world treats you like a blank doesn't mean you have to act like a blank. I mean, think about this. You let the consistency of your obedience to God speak for itself. And what I mean by that is, is you don't have to be right. You're just simply looking to honor God with what you say. Meaning that it's not what I want to say, it's what he wants me to say. And when, this, is, this is what I know. When, when consistency starts speaking up, the favor of God starts moving. When you do finally have something to say, it'll be worth saying. And when you start saying it, people start taking note. But here's the thing. The world is always going to squeeze you and press on you. It may, it may even cause you to be very symbolic of this donkey in a way where you know you're on a path. And God has placed something before you. And the world is saying, get off the path. And you may run and come back. And you may... Even get to the point where you feel like you have to lay down under the pressure. But under that pressure, you know what happens? Is that Balaam says, you've made me look like a fool. But let me tell you this. If you're going to go in this world and you're going to go for Jesus, I'd rather you do this. I'd rather you go being a fool for Jesus than anything else. If you're going to be a fool, be a fool for Jesus. If the world's going to call you out, then, then, then you call on the name of Jesus. You let him know who you're, you're being a fool for. Be a stick. Be a rock. Be a donkey. It's not about, listen to me, it's not about what these things can do. It's about what they can be when they're in the hands of God. Do you hear me this morning? It's not about what these things can do. It's about what they can be in the hands of God. And if you're in the hands of God this morning, then stop putting limitations on what God can do with your life. Come on, we, 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 we have a life verse in Philippians 4.13. I can do all things in, in Christ and through Christ who gives me strength. Is that just a nice quote for your, your bumper or is that the reality of your life? Do you actually believe that you can do all things in Christ Jesus? There's no limitations on what God can do with your life. Do you believe that this morning? That if he can use a rock, if he can use a stick, if he can use a donkey, then what can he do with your life? Jesus himself said, Jesus himself said, look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store up in barns. If your heavenly father feeds them and cares for them, how much more valuable are you than these? Look at this. If he can part a sea with a stick and cause a rock to worship and produce water and make a donkey to talk, what can he do with your life? What can he do with your life? What is possible with God? Be a stick. Be a stick. You see, a stick, in my mind, it doesn't push back, talk back, or sit back. As sim simply put, a stick simply does what it's commanded to do. But, but here's the thing. I think a lot of times in the church and as Christians, we don't value the importance of the stick. See, I would rather be a shiny new car than a stick. I'd rather be a golden chandelier than a stick. But, 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 but here's the important part. When you begin to embrace the identity that, that God has given you, no matter what you are, it's enough. Why? Because he's enough. And there's no, I mean, look, if he wants to take a stick if, that is your life and turn it into a beach house condo, he can. But you've got to give him permission to do so. But here's the thing. This is my biggest concern. Maybe, maybe you're saying I had a man come to me after first service and say, I'm a stick. 
I've got notches, I've got scratches, I've got marks in my life. But I'm trying to be the best stick that I can be for Jesus Christ. This is what I will say to you. Be all that you've been called to be for Jesus by simply embracing what seems insignificant. The Bible would say it like this. Do not despise these small and humble beginnings. It may just appear that my life is just a stick, but you watch when you start giving God permission to work on the stick, what that stick becomes. Be a stick. Be a rock. A rock is just a rock until it's in the right hands. A rock is just a rock until... God gets a hold of it. A rock never confides. It never seals its uses. It's open to be used to accomplish whatever God wants it to accomplish. You saw at the end of that list about rocks was the listing of the scripture, 1 Samuel 17. If you know that story, David is walking with a stick and a sling in hand. And he decides to pick up a rock. Five, a matter of fact. But it only took one. See, a rock is just a rock until it gets in the right hands. And he slings this rock in a physical sense, and it sinks into a man's head, and he dies. You come against me with spear and javelin, defying the army of God, but I come come with you of the name of the Lord. It was the same of Jesus when he was in the wilderness being tempted by Satan. He picked up a rock called the Word of God. And he said to Satan three times, it is written, it is written, it is written. See, he may have never slung a physical rock, but the rock that he was slinging was one that doesn't move. Am I preaching to anybody this morning? Jesus would say it like this. The man that builds his house On the rock. Isn't moved when all the storms of life start coming. This is what I'm saying. Be a rock by building on the rock. That way when the news comes, you're not moved. That way when the tides change, you're not moved. That way in in, in West Virginia, when the weather starts changing every five minutes, you're not moved. At least some of you are listening. I'm building on the rock. And because I've been building on the rock, I'm being made like the rock. Be a stick. Be a rock. Be a donkey. See, a donkey is about having an attitude of gratitude. That no no matter who is on my back, (laughs) I'm not doing it for them. I'm doing it for the glory of God. See, if you're going to be a donkey, be a person that carries around the king of glory. Not so that you can be seen, but so that he can be seen. That way, even when the world's on your back, you can point to the one who's riding in on the donkey. Come on. Mary was placed on the back of a donkey when she was carrying the Savior. Jesus entered in on a donkey if you're going to be a donkey let God be seen as you carry him see a donkey's built for the journey it's like the sail when it when there's wind blown on it it has to move when the donkey receives the instruction that we're going on the journey it sets its feet for the race It begins to move. And in case you don't know this, this walk of faith is not a sprint. It's a marathon. And so don't grow weary in what you're doing for Christ. Even in the midst of the journey. listen, Listen to this. And I think this is important. I think I need to tell you this. In your seeking of God, if you treat any part of the Godhead like an it then all you'll ever do is ask to use it. If you treat God the Father like an it, if you treat Jesus the Son like an it, if you treat the Holy Spirit like it's an it, you always will see it as a power 
that I have to use. But see, when you start to commune with God, when you start to say, Lord Jesus, let me be a stick for you. Lord Jesus, let me be a rock for you. Lord Jesus, let me be a donkey for you. And you avail yourself to him. See, what happens in that language is you start to say to God, no, it's not about me using you, God. It's about you using me. It's about you using me. And however you want to use me, let it be for your glory. See, being a stick, being a rock, being a donkey isn't about you using God. It's about God using you. Let's land the ship. Let this be your prayer this morning. Make me a stick. Make me a rock. Make me a donkey. God, what I'm saying to you this morning is use me however you want to use me. Amen and amen. As the praise team comes, let me, let me close with this final statement. Jesus hung on a stick. He hung on a tree, right? So two trees were made to form a cross, and Jesus hung on that cross. And in the midst of being placed on a stick, his arms are spread open wide. And I've always loved that about Jesus, because even in the midst of being kind of pulled apart by these sticks and these nails that have been driven into the wood, what he's saying to you and me is looking out on us and saying, this is how much I love you, and my arms are open wide to receive you. It brings me great pleasure and joy to die on this cross so that you would receive eternal life. You don't have to pay the price. I already did. But in the price that I paid for you, would you come to me? And in your coming to me, would your life be submissive in a way that you are like a stick, like a rock, like a donkey? But I know you're not those things because you're far more valuable. See, Jesus is looking at each person in the room right now saying, I love you and I'm calling you. Will you come to me? Will you surrender and submit submit your life to me? And so this is what I'm going to ask you to do. Maybe you're here this morning. And you never have or you need to again. You've never given your life to Jesus. You've never acknowledged that Jesus died for you on a cross, was laid in a grave, but because death could not hold perfection, he resurrected and says to you, come into life, come into love. And if you believe in that this morning, would you not just declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord? But I'm going to ask you here, here in a few seconds to raise your hand and then pray with me. Not making a symbol, but making the actual actuality that I am giving my life to Jesus. I want Jesus to be my Savior. I want Jesus to be my Lord. If that's you, would you raise your hands on the count of three? One, two, three. Raise your hand. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yes, Lord, thank you. Whew, thank you, Jesus. I see your hand. I see your hand. I see your hand. Thank you. This isn't, this isn't for other people. This is between you, me, and God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. I saw the hand back there. Thank you. Thank you. Would you pray, if that's you and you just raise your hand, would you pray this? Lord Jesus, forgive me. Create in me a new heart, oh God. I lay my sins and my burdens at your feet. And I both acknowledge and believe in your sacrifice, Jesus, that you died on the cross for me. And today I'm laying down my life and making you the Lord of it. Jesus, be my Lord. Jesus, be my Savior. I surrender to you. I give you my life. And Father, for those in the room that have already done that, But God, you're saying to them, you need to go deeper. I pray today that they would make themselves a living sacrifice, as your word says. 
that they would lay themselves down in such a way that they would appear like a stick on the ground or a rock that's just waiting to be used by you or a donkey that's been holding its, its tongue its whole life waiting for you to call on it and give it the ability to speak. Father, I think about what Pastor Kevin prayed at the first service. Who is it in this service right now that needs to answer the call on their life to become a pastor? That needs to answer the call on their life to become an ambassador for you? God, maybe there's a a person online right now or in this room that they've been thinking about going to school, to seminary, to get a degree, to to seek out ministry for you. God, I pray that they would not deny that call. But in this moment, you would reveal a fresh revelation that you did call them. You did plant that seed. And God, for all of us that are being faithful sticks, faithful rocks, faithful donkeys, thank you that your word says one waters, one sows, but you provide the increase. Jesus, that's what I'm asking for right now. In a very real way, in the midst of all the sticks, rocks, and donkeys in this room, would you provide an increase? In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Would you celebrate with me those that just rededicated or gave their life to the Lord? Come on. Heaven is rejoicing when a sinner comes to be saved and rescued by Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord.